This evening I'll try and steer you through the history of the Castle Island to go up the Clay railway line which was opened in 1875 and it ran all the way up to uh, January 1977. Anybody who remembers any aspect of the, of, the, of the railway's history will remember it with great fondness. First of all, because of the, what it brought to the town in its time, and it must have been a wonderful sight to see the, the, see, to see the first train coming in along the tracks, in through the fields, in through the likes of Nottnagore and Farnabrack and all the way into town, with its trundling iron steam and, and mass. And later, of course, when the, the, on the days when the train came in and when it was finished with the yard, when it went back out again, the yard was taken over by children playing football or playing skipping or hurling and soccer and all that kind of stuff. And the, the, the bottom of the towners at the time developed their own little patch, which was called the polo. It was, a, I suppose it was about a, um, maybe half an acre of ground just off the track at the back of what is now brown or what was then Brown's uh, mineral waters. It, it sounded or it seemed to us at the time that it was a huge space but looking back on it later on it was a tiny little space but as children we made the most of it for games that um, games that took on the importance of an All-Ireland final at the time were played out there between teams from various areas of the town. Um, it was while I was taking a photograph in February uh, 2019 of a group of, of uh, transition year students from Castle Island Community College and their teachers and members of the Tidy Towns group that one or two of the students came up to me and they said they asked me was there really a railway station here and did a train really come in here? I turned on my heels and I looked back along the, the, the yard and there was a white car park maybe 100 yards from where we were standing and I said, believe it or not, I said, a train came right in as far as that white car. And they looked at me with incredulity. But what they had done in their own way and maybe not realising the full impact of what they had done was that they had created um, a memory, um, a, a reminder, I suppose, for, for, for me and um, a commemoration of that 102 years that the train came all the way from Got the Clay to Castle Island and um, now it's no more. Mind you there are some, the, 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 the house, the keeper's house, the station master's house is still functioning as a living quarters um, but very little other than that there's a water tower back the railway tracks a small little bit or back the tracks as we said here as we used to say here um, that is still there and um, Eamon Fleming is a Castle Island man who was um, um, an officer with Kerry County Council at the time, a heritage officer. He got um, a preservation order put on that. So that is something that needs to be, that needs to be seen to, and I must have a look at it myself because obviously the, the railway line now has been clo closed off for a long time. But in its day, even after the, the train stopped running in 77 it was still used as a, a great source of uh, a great route of leisure for the people of the town and it um, um it's it, it had its own it had its own beauty of course and uh, it, it it started to to um to be enveloped back into farming land and stuff like that the brambles and the bushes and things like that began to grow into the tracks but um, the late Paddy Hosey, who had a pub at the bottom of the town in, in the Conhool and Christian Latin Quarter, used to go back there with a couple of more people, and he, with his hedge slippers and the briar hook and stuff like that, and he kept it, he kept it clean for years, and um, and of course, the, the the common slang with at the time was um, we went for a walk back the tracks. Back the tracks became a catch cry for anyone who had who. Um, from the bottom of the town especially, the people on top of the town had the likes of the Craig Eend and all these places to walk around and walk through on the bank of the river and that kind of thing, but for the bottom of the towners it was back the tracks. There is a lot of specifics involved in explaining the, the, um, the Castle Island Railway because it was one of the first narrow gauge railways in, in Ireland at the time when it was built in 1875. Notices began to appear in the local papers in the early 1870s um, about the Castle Island Railway Company and it was a Castle Island to Gut the Clay route. That's what they had mapped out. And there was five landlords here at the time and they, get, they, they formed um, that particular Castle Island Railway Committee. 
and they started raising money and in fact it was mentioned in the House of Parliament in England and they got the go ahead and amazingly quickly from the early 70s to 1875 when the first train came in here that was an incredible work rate to lay four miles four and a half miles or whatever it was at the time of track and to get the actual train and the, and, and the engine running um, on it in that space of time now the engineers at the time reported that they were very lucky because the ground was flat and the ground was was uh, well able to take um, the re albeit reduced weight of the of the narrow gauge train and whatever carriages it would have and there was a most beautiful carriage a uh, most beautiful engine with with built-in carriages which was unusual as well at the time it seems um, locomotive number 90 it was known as and that was built in Dublin in in Chicor and they built a little carriage onto the engine which was very unusual and that would seat eight people and that must be that must have been the essence of coziness and comfort at the time um, and that ran that ran for several years until such time as the, uh, the 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 line had to be upgraded and i suppose diesel came in later later on then after that but interestingly enough that locomotive number 90 is alive and well today and in um, it's in the museum i think it's the down patrick um, railway society um, headquarters and it's been done every nut and bolt and that and was, was apparently taken apart and it was completely refurbished and apparently it is well able to do a little run now but it is in the it is in that museum and that's a trip that uh, myself and a couple of more of islanders with um, with that kind of railway nostalgia are looking forward to to paying a visitor when the when all this covid-19 stuff is, has is has gone gone past us on the day i met the students at the um, at the railway gate and at, at the unveiling of their model um, I didn't get a chance to tell them or to explain to them about the day-long hive of activity that the railway yard was at the time when those trains came in morning and evening I mean they brought in everything that was needed in the town at the time in terms of building material timber cement that kind of thing new cars for the for the the, the garages that were here at the time and that was mainly um, that was mainly the vans and the herons all those cars came in here um, and an old the Lord to mercy and the woman Sheila Prindable remembers the, the days when when um, she always knew she said looking looking out her shop window that the train was in because she'd see the boys from the various hotels and lodging houses around the town at the time they'd be heading to, to the railway yard with trucks and handcarts and stuff like that to meet commercial travelers who'd be staying in there in the, the lodging houses and hotels that they were working for and they'd bring their bags from the from the the railway station to the the lodgings and that kind of thing and the commercial travelers to whom the bags belonged would do the town for the next couple of days whatever they were selling hardware clothes whatever it was and they'd go back the boys would be back down the following morning or the morning after whatever it was and um they'd be taking the the the, the, the lodgers the train the the travelers uh, bags and belongings back down to the train again and, and setting them off now an awful lot of people who immigrated from castle island at the time left by the railway station and um, there were people who immigrated willingly but sadly there were people who immigrated unwillingly the late Mike Mitchell told me a story one day, a heartbreaking story really, of seeing a 15-year-old girl that he knew. Uh, she was being put on the train below and she bawled and she cried and she pleaded with people standing by and she pleaded with her mother um, not to let her go but the father insisted and she was put on the train all on her own and she was being sent to America because an older sister had gone over there before her and um, she was obviously making the dollars and sending them home to keep the farm that they, they, they lived in a small hillside farm around here somewhere um, but Mike Mitchell told me that, that that was one of several heartbreaking incidents that he that he had seen um, in the railway on the railway station the railway platform at the time in Castle Island um, fair days kept the train and the track and the, the, the business alive for many years because there, there would have been uh, huge cattle fairs on a monthly basis here and there were pig fairs every Tuesday and 
Another thing too that kept the train going for years during the war years was, um, and Danny Shee, his photograph will prove that, that there was a queue of horses and rails of turf coming down from the Limerick roadside and that, that all had to be weighed down at the, um, down at the railway and the way bridge just outside the railway gates and taken on and put on the carriages to be shipped out. And one of the amazing things, and I vaguely remember it, um, it, it lasted up to the 60s, I believe, uh, there was an excursion train during summer Sundays and that I believe went to Feenit. Obviously it went to the went to Gut de Clay onto the Tralee track and in through Tralee and I believe that there was a and I think there is of course there are still there are still signs of it there, um, a railway line out to Feenit. And of course we came back there in the evenings. Um I had a long, long love affair with the train because it ran into town and out of town, of course, a couple of fields down from our house and, and on clear frosty mornings you'd hear the, the you'd hear the the bell and the whistle and, and and you'd see the steam some mornings and the smoke and you'd know it was on its way and I was often late for school because I waited it for it for it to come in because Trillia Road and the railway converged almost to a point because anybody who knows the geography of the town you have Killarney Road on one side, Trillia Road on the other side and right in the middle was the railway yard so the roads converged so that Killarney Road, Trillia Road converged almost to a point at the back of the forge. So the nearer I got to town the closer the train came to me through the fields and there were several gaps of course there was a gap into every field off the main road at the time and i just make it to one gap and to another gap then before the train came um, any closer and that kind of thing so obviously it was slowing down by the time it reached our house and 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 that sort of thing so it was easy keep it was easy keep pace with it but i don't know the romance of that i'll I never forget. I even dream about it. I I dream about it still that somebody somebody has is calling me come, to come down to come down to see the train is coming in. The train is coming in and that kind of thing. And and I know that I can hardly believe it. But when I get there, there it is, and with its steam and its grime and everything and every blessed thing about it that we remember. On Saturday mornings, I used to run down through the fields. To get a closer view, obviously we were off school, and there was only there was a um, a, a gap, a well-made gap by us down through Reedy's fields and not in the gore, and because we used to go down to the main river there fishing, we'd go down as far as the railway the railway tracks. Obviously, go back go back along, go down through um, down through Reedy's, like I said, and then off down to the main. Then we'd fish the main, maybe back as far as camp, and and um, go up Camp Road into the onto the tracks again and walking along and then cut up through um Willie Reedy's field Danny Reedy's that time his son Willie owns them now but um that was our um long association but I loved on Saturday mornings to to race down through the fields and um and you'd have to be in your mouth and, and to get away from the away from the train driver was, was something else altogether. You felt that you felt really important because I really looked up to these people. I saw one of them at close quarters one day. I was, I was um, standing in Davy Griffin's door with the Evening Press, I remember, because I was reading about Muhammad Ali and, and uh, Sonny List and their first fight in 1964. And the man was looking over my shoulder. He was on his way out of the shop, of course, but he looked over my shoulder. He, he asked me who I think, who I thought would win. And of course, I believed all um, Cassius Clay, as he was known as at the time, I believed all his hype and all this kind of stuff and he was proved right afterwards but the man asked me he had his railway cap on his railway jacket and things like that and I thought I was made. Um, the railway company was set up in 1872 and this was a while after actually that the, 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 these um, advertisements started to appear but I presume that this formed some kind of an ad hoc committee but uh, the likes of Lord Ventry, Lord Headley, Sam Hosey and John Godfrey, they went to work on the line, uh, they went to work on the, the, the company, I should say. And they, they obviously acquired the land, they acquired the finances and like I, like I said before, they, 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 it was an incredible amount of work to get done in those few years. Because I mean, that there was there was nothing like air moving equipment or it all had to be done by hand and all that kind of stuff at the time. Um, I heard once upon a time that the the original line was supposed to be was supposed to be cast line was supposed to be taken in on the original line. 
in terms of it was supposed to start in Trillier, start in Killarney, whichever way you want to look at it, and it was to take in Castle Island on its loop and go on to Trillier, go on to Killarney, whichever way, but they didn't, obviously, they, they, they decided in their wisdom at the time that, um, that the looping it into Castle Island would cost too much. The Castle Island people uh, in, in business and the people who, who had a shout at the time kicked up stink and threatened to withhold rates or whatever else they had the power to withhold and um, it was decided then to, to do the to create this sport branch as they called at the time from Gutta Clay to Castle Island and I suppose really it was doomed to failure from the start being a sport being a sport line that um, that it wouldn't have the um, if if whatever commercial um, commercial uh, business was going on in in Castle Island at the time if that couldn't support it it was a dead duck and so it proved. For this look back the tracks of Castle Island's railway history, we enlisted the help of local photographer, historian, and photo collector Timothy Murphy. Timothy's family business of hardware merchants depended heavily on the supply lines supplied by the railway in those early years. The railway was a great economic benefit to the merchants in Castle Island. Now my family, we had a, a business, T.H. Murphy Limited, we were a, a hardware merchants, builders, providers. The one thing in my abiding memory of the railway station is uh, the train coming in with wa pulling wagons of cement. Now inside the wagon uh, would have two doors, one open left, one open right. And inside the wagon then like there was hundred bags of cement. There was um, and in each wagon would contain twelve tons of cement. And uh, the bags were about one hundred well bags. So that meant like in, in in a ton there was twenty bags and in twelve tons then there was two hundred and forty bags. All of those bags had to be handled one by one by hand out of the wagon. Now THS didn't, as, as we were known as abbreviated, we had a man employed in with a pony and car. That man then like, would put 12 bags of cement each time onto his pony and car, out the railway, up the street, into THS yard, and handle all those bags one by one into the street. Down the street again, repeat that operation, and that went on until the, the whole 240 bags had been um, brought from the railway wagon and put in, both into the store. That's the way things were done right in those days. As I said, like, there were 50 kg bags, now uh, there are only 25 kg bags. Mm -hmm. Health and safety, the times that we are living in. And Timothy, that was Tommy O'Sullivan, of course, what they would have seen. That was Tommy O'Sullivan. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how long would it have taken him to clear a wagon of the, of the cement, to transfer the cement from the wagon to the, well, the shape? Uh, it might have gone on for maybe two, maybe three days. Would it? It was depending on the weather, of course. And mm -hmm. Because Tommy was also employed as well as um, uh, drawing the cement from the station up to the, into the yard. Um, there would be deliveries in like around the town, you see, yeah. uh, where, where you sell gas and coal and briquettes and other material like as well. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was part of Tommy's duties like as well too, doing the town deliveries like around the town with his, with his pony and cow. Now as time moved on of course like uh, there was a, a decline in uh, the, the amount of goods and carriages coming into the railway station. Reason being road freight took over. The day of the wagon with the 140 bags like, went into decline. Taken over by the articulated lorry, like pallets on the lorry, that there the articulated lorry could be loaded to see below in the factory, like in Limerick, below in Moonlit, brought on to Castle Island, or Tralee, or whatever, into a yard, and the pallets taken off by 40. That was it. Like, no more, all this handling in and out. Change time. Now another memory that I have of the railway station like is a man who was employed by CIE and he would deliver goods like from the railway station around to the different merchants and different shopkeepers in the town. The reason he would deliver the goods like was those goods were what was called carriage pay home. Whoever like was supplying those goods to the merchant, they paid the carriage fees. The man like he was George Horton up there in Castleview known far and wide by everybody as George D. George D then would come in with, with his lorry in above in Tor Yard, or we would unload like whatever it would be to see that he would be delivering. Take it off and George would go away. 
Cabbage Cabbage please. Then another feature like other railway station like was that the garages like in the town like uh, uh, no cars that would be delivered like to the garages would come in on uh, on, the, on the train. There were special there were special uh, well, carriages, special wagons, they were flatbed. And some of you people like might remember like in the centre of the railway station, out towards the end, out near the gate, there was a uh, one buffer and at this side of the buffer then there was a ramp. And what they would do like with the flat bed wagon with the car on it, run that wagon up against the buffer and then drive the car off the wagon down the ramp onto the ramp. And they would keep on doing that then until whatever number of cars like were being delivered, like would be off the wagon. It's like the circus long ago, like in America. They would move one car from one uh, flat uh, bed wagon to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, until all the carriages were unloaded. Again, transport took over, road transport finished all that of course. And nowadays the carriages like in the town, uh, all the cars, no cars, are all delivered by road transport. Again. Now, Castle Island like, was well known then for its fair days. And over the course of the year, there was some of the fairs, like, depending on the, t and, uh, the time of the year, there would be huge fairs, like, big numbers of cattle would be coming in, like, and uh, one of those fairs, like, would be November the first fair day. And I remember then, like, to say, jobbers mightn't have the transport of their own, like, at the time. So, and the cattle buyers wouldn't have their own transport. So what they would do then, like, is they would herd the cattle, like, down into the railway station. And at the end of the platform, like, I have distinct memories, like, of cattle pens being down there. Mm -hmm. Cattle were put into them pens, and, and they were housed in there until sometime late in the evening. Then a special train would arrive, like, from Tralee, with railway wagons, especially, like, for the transport, like, of live animals. The animals were put in, like, into those wagons, and then the train would move off then back to go to clay onto Trilly. There was many a time down in the railway station after the big fair day when all those uh, wagons would be filled they would be ending up to 100 wagons of cattle leaving the town. Now John, uh, I was interested like in the history of the town and uh, I was very interested like in the railway because on account of the economic impact it had on the town and the benefit it had to the town. So I used to come down from time to time like with my camera and take photographs like in the railway yard. And um, my visits down to the yard would have been uh, from time to time over a number of years. Each time I came down like that railway yard was full of railway wagons of all description. There was a number of lines in the, in the yard and there would be lines of wagons like in each, uh, in each line. Nancy Mahoney recalls arriving at Camp Crossing as a young married woman in 1960. She remembers all the trains and the characters associated with the railway and the people who walked back the tracks in the evenings, while her daughter Nora recalls the privileges of having a dad who walked on the railway. How do we come to Camp Crossing? Well, I'll tell you now, Nora. Uh, I was friends with your father, and he was a railway man below in Kilgarvan. And we met in Cashland in Bryant's Hall and um, to be after Book Fair I'd say around the 16th of August Okay. and that's where I first met him uh, he was working for and for they were doing a job there and what, the railway line? With the railway what? line okay. he was working the railway line his father before him worked in the railway line and uh, his, his, bro his brother Timmy was working in the Kinmere Railway Station. He was coming out in the yard in the train out to Hedford. Okay. And uh, that's what my son McConnie first met. So how do we come here then, if we were well, from Kilgarvan? Well, well, the, the railway line, the railway closed here on the, the 16th. We came here on the 16th of November. Okay. And uh, 1961. Okay. Uh, your father was signed on to this place right. and uh, he got a job in Cashleiden and we were here. And had you any job to do here? No, 
I do. When I came here, I didn't open the gates. How many times a day? Twice, twice a day. The train went in in the morning, came back out, went in again in the evening and came back again and to go to clear. And what was it? Just goods or goods, passenger? Passengers or and, and cattle. Okay. And uh, that's where we were. Did it ever bring cars or anything oh, like yeah, that? Oh, it did. It did. Yeah? It did. Van scavenged that him and... Go away. Yeah. And they just yes, drop off the cars. They just drop off the cars and, and then the train come back, back through the again. taxi again. Yes, maybe a special would come in sometimes. Okay. If there was a fair and get home, and if it was late, they could come in in the evening at maybe six o'clock, and maybe to be out up and go out. Okay. And was there any excursions to the okay. likes of, no. say, Glimbe oh, or Phoenix? No, or that or was any? over at the time when I came here. Was it? That was all over. Okay. And uh, and, uh, the train would. Have we d- we have no we had no phone here or anything like him, and to the we should only depend on the dead hood in the train coming out. Okay. Because we no phone or anything. In. As you know, the last train passed through passed here. Through here. On January 1977, you opened and closed the gates. What were your thoughts that day? Oh, I was lonesome to see it going. I was all about it. I was. I was. What made you so lonesome? I don't know. We didn't know where I'd be going next. That was where it was. Only he had been sent to Trillia at the time. So that had been that transferred? Had, uh, tr- tr- and you still remained and in, I still re- in the house? And still in the house. Okay. Mm. And can you remember all the people of the town that used to walk the tracks? Oh, uh, the, the, nuns, nuns. the nuns used to come out regular. The nuns? The nuns used to oh, come no out way. regular. Out to the gates. Okay. They'd come out from the line and walk up or go around the road into town again. Okay. Yeah. And anybody else? Can you remember oh, anybody so else used to come oh, out? Yeah, all cash renders come out here. Yeah. All cash renders just walk back the railway here. Okay. It was a lovely time to be here. Yeah, I know, it was a good time to be here. Yeah, So, Mum, over the years, there was a load of fellas, obviously, would have worked on the railway line and worked in our old house. Can you remember any of their names? I do. Uh, Patsy Kerrisk. James Sullivan. Okay. Uh, Oh, there were several. Jackie Power, wasn't there? Well, he was only, he was our, he was our inspector, I suppose, you could say. Uh, and you had Paddy Russell, Paddy who Russell, used to work with dad. Dad, he was And Jackie Crow. And Jackie Crow. He was working in the houses. Yeah. And would they, they repair could, the houses then? Oh, they did. They did. In the old house we had here. Yeah. The railway house. But it, uh, the, that house was very damp. Okay. And we got a room built. There was only two rooms in it. And we got the extra room built. Do you remember the, the bogey, as they used to call it? I do. Will you explain to us? Uh, what was that? That used to take the sleepers yeah. from one place to another. And uh, uh, Jackie and then we said we used to drive that bogey. Okay. So the bogey, just for people that don't know, have, have any of, know what it's about. It's it was a small little truck on the line. On the line. It was all the sleepers over it. Like. Yeah. And uh, they used to, it, to lo- lo- load it up with sleepers like and take them from one place to another. So really and truly, it was an open back trailer, like open a toolbox. To yeah, because I remember when when Dennis, myself and my brother Dennis, was was going to school here in the national school in town, and we'd have three drivers mm. in the evening. God be good to them. The three of them are gone up to Holy God at this stage. We'd have Master Hennepin, and we'd have Charlie Connor mm. and Tommy Watson. And do you remember, we'd know in the morning when Daddy'd be back Daddy the line. Line. So we'd come home, we'd get off the bus, and we'd say goodbye and thanks, sir. Throw our bags into the front room, and then we'd run back the line. Because the faster we ran back, the more of the drive home we got. Right. And we'd be put up behind right. and they'd make sure that there was no kerosene Carrot. or creaso or anything on our clothes. And we'd be pushed back home, which yeah. were great, great times. But that yes. was that was back in 1974, 75. Yes. That yes. was yes. yesterday or today in Ellis yes. Church, yes. wasn't it? No, no, no. Long time ago. No, no. But great memories all oh, the same. They were. They were. 